Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Gan Hua. Uh, Gan is not a stranger to us. Uh, uh, he did an internship with Zhichen and me uh, a few, quite a few years ago, and then uh, he joined the Live Lab. After Live Lab uh, was dissolved, he moved on to a number of places, including <laughs> Nokia Research Lab, IBM Research, uh, and now he's an associate professor at the Stevens Institute of Technology. And today uh, he will talk about uh, a probabilistic elastic part model for face recognition. So uh, let's uh, listen to it. Okay, Can thanks, Jin yeah. uh, It is a great pleasure to revisit the uh, MSR, uh, one of the best computer science research institutes in the world. Uh, so today my talk is about uh, a flexible part-based representation for real-world face recognition. Okay, so you may wonder. After 30 years of research, why sh should we still care about the face recognition research? I think a, a short answer for that, it is still not solved yet. Okay? So before I get into the technical part, I want to brief introduce, uh, briefly introduce my school. So Stevens is in a beautiful campus on the New Jersey side uh, of the Hudson River. So we oversee the skyline of uh, New York City. Basically, the opposite side is uh, Manhattan downtown. So it's a beautiful campus. And uh, uh, most New Yorkers, when they come to, uh, I mean, perhaps in their lifetime, they never come to, the, to, to our side, and they, they never had the chance to see the skyline of uh, Manhattan. So next time, if you happen to be nearby, uh, give me an email, and uh, I can arrange a uh, visit to, uh, to our campus. OK, so current research in my group uh, uh, I categorize them into three themes. Uh, the first is on um, human-centered uh, visual computing. Uh, I tend to do my research centered around human, like uh, understand human from image and videos, and uh, also do interactive uh, uh, type of uh, recognition tagging and things like that. Uh, so the second theme of my uh, uh, research, research in my group is on um, big visual data. Again, part of the efforts is originated from my, my experience here, like designing compact local image descriptors, all the way to uh, modeling like a contextual information, including social networking context for, for, for recognition, essentially. The third theme of research I initiated at the school uh, after I joined uh, Stevens is on this uh, egocentric vision-based uh, cyber-physical and uh, uh, co-robot uh, co system. The reason I call it a cold robot system is because we want to build an integrated human and a robotic system. Uh, for example, one of our goals is trying to use that uh, egocentric camera. This is a very cheap camera. Uh, the, 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 the one on the right side is a very cheap uh, spy camera I bought from China. So there is a pinhole camera in between of the camera glasses. and. Uh, we want to enable the users to use that camera to control a wheelchair. You, you may imagine like a, for a quadriplegic individual, they, they lose hand functionality, they cannot really control the wheelchair. We want to build a co-robot system where most often this uh, wheelchair robot is moving autonomously. But whenever it is unsure about the, what next step to make, it could ask the human for control. Then that quadriplegic individual could use that the camera to control it. Then it would actually record the input uh, like from the sensors and output from the user controls. Then we hope to build a, a linear algorithm which can evolve the decision engine of that wheelchair system so in the future it could handle similar situation. Okay? So that's about the, the overall description of the research in my group. So uh, back to face recognition, why do we really care about the post variation? The simple reason is that the posts would actually mingle all the visual variations together, so it makes things really complicated. We, we all know that from the seminal paper of vacant face and illumination call, seeing that if, if the, if the post isn't changing, then everything becomes linear and it's easy to handle, right? So, but as you can see from these examples, once we have a lot of post variations, things become really complicated. So we want to better handle posts with, uh, with uh, better uh, visual rep representation of the face. So there's two uh, types of uh, approach uh, 
approaches to um, handle post variation. The first the theme of research, they focus on face alignment, identify facial landmarks. I think there's a series of work from Microsoft Research Asia. They have really built some good face alignment algorithm for real world photos. Okay, just from my private conversation though with uh, with Jen, like uh, he he told me that. Uh, uh, the current face alignment algorithm in MSRI actually failed on those YouTube videos. Uh, there is a benchmark for the YouTube video face, uh, faces data sets uh, released by Leon Wolf. I think Jen's algorithm didn't really uh, fly on that video database. So uh, we, we are going to revisit that uh, to see why our representation is better. So a lot of theme of research trying to build a robust matching algorithm uh, to handle better handle post variations. My, my personal research is really focused on this domain because I believe like low, low, low face alignment algorithm is going to be perfect. So you want to build a robust matching algorithm to, to handle any possible visual uh, post variations you could still have. So, so our approach is to take a part-based uh, representation. We want to build a part-based model, okay. Previous work on part-based uh, uh, representation for face images is mostly handcrafted. For example, these parts could be defined uh, around like uh, facial landmarks and, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, what we want to do though, we want to uh, learn the parts in an unsupervised fashion from a set of training data, okay? Then we want to build a generative model where once we have this part-based model, we can and identify this each specific uh, parts in a specific input image, then we can use this part, specific part in that image as the representation, okay? We're going to talk about the, 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 the benefit of having such a representation, okay? So there are a bunch of work recently also uh, on uh, more general face, uh, more general object detection and object recognition, trying to build a part-based representation as an intermediate level representation. Uh, but they, they, they haven't applied it on face, and some of the approach, I, I do not see why they could be used on, on the face domain, okay? So, so given this, and uh, here is the outline of the rest of my talk. So first, I'm going to introduce this uh, probabilistic uh, elastic part model. Uh, it's a very simple algorithm, uh, but uh, hopefully I can convince you that it is very effective, okay? So then I'm going to talk about two applications. The first is on face verification, okay? So one good side of our representation is that it provides a unified representation for both image and video-based uh, uh, face verification. That, that means we, can, we have this representation where we can enable a single face image to, to be matched directly with uh, a video clip without resorting to this frame by frame cross matching, okay, pairwise matching. Okay, we, also, we will also talk about how we could use this uh, representation for enhancing any offline trained face detector. Uh, it is an unsupervised detector adaptation algorithm. Like, uh, hopefully, I think I presented, uh, briefly described some of the work we did before on how to adapt a detector to a video. Here is just we try to uh, do an unsupervised detector adaptation to our photo connection to make it better. So this part of the work, we, we have published in CVPR 2013, and uh, this, this part of work is going to be presented in ICCV 2013. So, uh, and the, some of the experiments we, we presented here will be uh, from our uh, recent PAMI submission because we did some more experiments and the results are improved, okay? So, so first, uh, what is uh, the probabilistic elastic part model? So, we have three goals for this uh, part-based representation. First, of course, we want it to be post-invariant, okay? The second, we want a unified representation for both image and video faces. The reason we want uh, it to be like that because we want to avoid this frame-to-frame -frame matching. And also, our ultimate goal is for face identification. So when you are trying to build a gallery database, we want the database really scale to the number of person instead of number of images in that gallery database. And uh, ultimately, we also want this representation to be additive, meaning that if you have a new face for one person added in, we can incrementally update that representation without resorting to all the uh, previous images, okay? So uh, I will show you how we achieve this. So again, the general philosophy, as I mentioned, we want to build a generative model where for each specific input image, we want to identify 
the specific parts for that face in, uh, in, in this image, and we use that as our representation. So just sort of give you uh, a sense of, from the low level, how we should enable to learn such a part-based model. We start with a very simple like a feature extraction process where we build an image pyramid for each input face image, and we, we densely extract the overlapping patches, OK? Then for each patch, we could build a, uh, we could extract a descriptor, either SIFT or LBP histogram from that. But we do something um, in addition to that. We augment the X and Y location of the, that descriptor to, to the overall descriptor. So we call it a spatial appearance feature uh, descriptor, OK? Then up to this point, we have a set of uh, features. Uh, it, is, uh, uh, the, uh, it has a spatial component and a location component. Uh, so, so the face is represented as a bag of features. But don't be confused by the words, because we're not going to build a dictionary to build a bag of words representation. We're going to do something different here. Okay? So then, how do we build this uh, elastic power model is we, we could gather a set of training images, then we can fit a Gaussian mixture model. Okay? In speech community, this is called a universal background model. Okay? But I will highlight something. We, we changed the model a little bit. I mean, it is more specific here, because we confine each Gaussian component to be a spherical Gaussian. The reason I will explain further, because we want to, to have a better way to control the balance between the spe uh, appearance part and the location part. Because you think about that the, the appearance Vector is about like a, a sift is 128 dimension. The location is only two dimension. So we need a better way to control the balance between them. If we use a diagonal coherence matrix, we won't be able to achieve that, as I will show in some example we are going to show. Okay. So of course this is a very simple maximum likelihood estimation problem with missing data. Okay. So we just gather a set of training data uh, going through that uh, feature extraction process to having like this special uh, location uh, fi uh, descriptors, then we're going to fit this Gaussian mixture model. Okay. In the end, as you can see, this Gaussian mixture model naturally comes with a set of parts. So here, the visualization is really uh, the set of uh, image patches associated with each Gaussian component. Okay. Up to this point, the method sounds to be really simple to you. Okay. So, so how, we're, how are we going to build the representation for each face image from this model? OK. Pay attention to this, because this, this is a symbol, but really uh, differentiating from the previous work. OK. So, so here, if I have a new input image here, suppose I have already learned this uh, a universal background model, OK, it's a Gaussian mixture model. So the, face, the input face is firstly represented as a bag of spatial appearance descriptor. Then in order to generate the final uh, representation for the face, instead of building a bag of words histogram, what we did here is that we do, do, do an in inverse assignment. Okay? So for each Gaussian component, we look for one of the descriptors inside, extracted from this input face image, which induces the highest probability on this Gaussian component. Okay? So for each Gaussian component, we identify such a feature. Then in the end, we concatenate that set of features we identified for each Gaussian component together to form a single descriptor vector for the face. As you can see, this is for Gaussian component three. Like, uh, this is the uh, probability map for, for that Gaussian component uh, like, uh, calculated uh, uh, with uh, each specific descriptor extracted from that face. As you can see, that. Uh, it is really representing the chain of the face. Okay, here is the color of this eye. Although they have uh, a lot of uh, post variations. Okay, so you could view this. This is more or less like a alignment process there. Okay, thanks. We have an implicit. Uh, uh, so by doing this maximum likelihood estimation, uh, like uh, identification of the features, we actually have a implicit alignment process. Uh, in this in this process, okay. So, do you put a location? Wait, descriptor. You actually put this. Yeah, it's up to this point, we discard the location. Okay. Yeah, we only have the appearance part in this final vector, okay. but it's indexed by each Gaussian component, as you can see. Sure. The Gaussian component uh, plays a role as a bridge to build a correspondence between two faces. Okay. So, so 
let's get into a little bit more details here because, as I said, we, we, we confine, confine each Gaussian component to be a spherical Gaussian. The reason for, for that is really this. Suppose, so here is just to show that if we use a regular Gaussian, for example, with a, a, a diagonal covariance matrix, here is the spatial span of the Gaussian component we learned. As you can see, the, the span large spatial regions uh, in the face, which is not the kind of behavior we want. The main reason for this is that the spatial part contribute more to the probability. Before, because you, if you pull the diagonal covariance matrix, you assume each dimension is independent. So if you try to uh, make the spatial component to contribute more by simply scaling that dimension, it's not going to be helpful because you're just going to uh, like uh, really enlarge the variance of that uh, uh, dimension when you are doing the EM estimation without the eff uh, affecting the other component. Versus if you, I mean, confine it to be a spherical Gaussian, then you mingle all the variance together. So if you scale the, uh, scale the location dimension, you essentially could uh, have the location uh, component to have uh, more influence. So the, the Gaussian component becomes more localized. So they, they are doing a local matching, essentially. So any questions here? OK. Another thing, why do we need this location component? Uh, the main reason is that, like, uh, OK, so we did the, this maximum likelihood identification without the spatial constraints, as you can see. You could easily match i with, with the, 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 the mouse part here. The main reason because we use a shift descriptor here. Shift is very good in shift, shifting uh, like a variance, like a, it's shifting variant. So you, you may match an I with, with this on the, in the descriptor space. Versus if we put this spatial constraint together, we re, we're really matching the I with the I. Okay? So that's why we need the, to do this um, a spatial component. Okay? So let's, let's say why this representation is post invariant. So we, we try to visualize that process, OK? So what we essentially did is for input face image, for each Gaussian component, we identify the local patch, OK, the, 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 with the highest probability. Then we put that patch back into the location of that Gaussian component, OK? So we synthesize this face. Essentially, that's the process, OK? As, as you can see that this face is nearly frontal. Here, although we, we average, it becomes blurred, blurred because we average the overlapping regions here without doing a lot of uh, uh, fancy sort of uh, uh, filtering there. Okay, so this is with suppose we just use this input image. So something additionally we can do is to really horizontally flip this face image, and then do the maximum likelihood identification with the joint set of uh, uh, spatial appearance. Descriptors, okay. So then, as you can see, the representation becomes more near, near more frontal. Okay, I can let you to see the difference there. So in the end, what we did is we we, we are going to adopt this uh, flipped version, like a joint version of of both. Okay. So here is just something more we can. I mean, because of this uh, inverse assignment based on the Gaussian component, we don't really care how many frames we have. Okay. So we can. Uh, for one frame, we can, for example, this is George Bush's face. Like, uh, we come out with, uh, with one representation, then with 10 frames, as you can see, the, it is nearly, it is more frontal in a sense. So it is more post invariant. Okay? So 20 frames, 50 frames, they don't ma really make a huge difference there. So we also have the version where we, we do the flipping for each of the frames there. As you can see, they, they, have, a, they have some difference, but uh, not too much if you integrate multiple frames together. Okay, so, so then why this is a unified representation is, is quite obvious for, for a single image and for a video face image. Uh, once, we have do, uh, once we have done the feature extraction, and then using this PEP model, we, we call it PEP model, stands for probabilistic elastic part model, okay? So once we use this uh, PEP model to, to select those features, in the end, they're going to have the same dimension because the feature dimension is with respect to the number of Gaussian component and the, the dimension of the feature descriptor. Okay? So that's why up to this, if once we have this representation, we can, comp uh, we can match this uh, single face image with, uh, uh, with a video clip directly without uh, 
resorting to the frame-to-frame -frame matching. Okay, so why it is incremental? Suppose you have a gallery database, you have a set, a set of faces from the same person. We, from this uh, uh, model, we can generate a, a single representation for this person, right? Uh, by, by doing this maximum likelihood identification. So it is incremental, uh, it could be incrementally updated mainly because the incremental nature of this uh, max operation. Because once you have this representation, you given a new face, we just need to compare if the maximum uh, likelihood uh, 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 identified uh, uh, feature is, has higher probability than the feature I already uh, have in this representation or not. If it is, then I just replace the uh, current representation. So it could be essentially incrementally updated if we have more faces added. Okay, that's, that's, the, that's another benefit of this. Although in this talk, we are not going to present any face identification results, but uh, uh, if we want to do face identification with this representation, we can make the database essentially scale with the number of person instead of number of uh, images in the database. Okay, so. So, so, so we, we build this UBM. Is, is UBM for one person? No, it's for, for the whole everybody. For everybody. For, for the population. For the each, population. Each person has different uh, variations, yeah. post variations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But here, when you talk about uh, representing one person. Right? So we assume that we already have that UBM model. Okay, so the, from UBM, then you, you sort of uh, yeah. uh, refine or, or sort of the personalization to do personalization into a single person. Yes, model. yes. So I'm, uh, I'm going to introduce a little bit the adaptation process when you are trying to do specific uh, matching for a pair of face images. We have a, a basic adaptation process there. That's more like, like a person specific uh, adaptation. Okay, so we're going to, I'm going to talk about in the face verification experiment, okay? So, so then, I mean, I hope you have get a sense of what this uh, uh, simple PEP model is, okay? Then I'm going to move forward to present two applications, one on face uh, verification and uh, the other on face detection. One question before you go to the application. Sure. Um, we, during the training phase, I assume you would need some kind of uh, alignment, right? No, uh, yeah, you could either do alignment or without any alignment. So without alignment, I assume that your, your GMM may not be very good. Um, we did some experiments. We are still better than, than uh, when this paper was published, it's still better than the best uh, in, in this evaluation, in this benchmark data. Alignment. Uh, yeah, yeah. We, we tried both. Like, uh, this algorithm would, uh, would, uh, would benefit from, uh, from some sort of alignment algorithm, but uh, yeah. Uh, because this representation is designed to be robust to post variations, as, as we have an implicit alignment process in, in building well, this. I thought in the training, you, 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 need a, you, you would need, it's good to have some alignment label, but in the testing, you are doing, implicitly doing alignment. Uh, that's a good question. You need, you need them to be consistent. Oh, I see, yes. If you have alignment in your, right. in your training phase, and you have to have the same alignment in your testing phase, I would say. Like, uh, yeah, that's, that's what uh, currently we are doing. But, uh, it would be interesting to try if we have alignment or without the alignment on the testing stage. Okay, so, sure. So for face verification, we are going to talk about like uh, results on uh, two uh, very popular uh, benchmarks. Okay, so, uh, so first we are going to talk about uncontrolled face verification. Like uh, we're going to introduce a very simple method first. To, uh, to use this uh, paper representation for, for face verification, then I'm going to talk about how we can do a little bit better. Suppose we, we want to enhance the matching of a specific uh, face pair, okay? Then I'm going to show that uh, uh, our, our uh, top performance on both uh, benchmark data set, okay? So how, how could we do the Imagine when we have a pair of face, we want to verify if they are the same person or not. So we're taking a very simple approach here. So once we have this uh, uh, representation, we call it the pair representation, then we just take the difference of these two representation, okay? We take the absolute difference vector. Then given a set of training images, training pairs uh, labeled with uh, uh, positive or negative, positive means they are from the same person, negative means they are a lot of the same person, then we can train a SVM 
on this different vector to, to make a decision on if they are the same person or not. So given any new testing phase, we can use this SVM classifier to make a decision. Okay, that's a very simple method. We haven't resorted to more complicated uh, metric learning algorithm yet. Uh, but I, I think, uh, I mean, if we have a better metric learning algorithm, it would uh, enhance the results indeed. Okay, so, so to make the representation to be even better, we have proposed a Bayesian adaptation scheme where Suppose this is the, what we call the PEP model, which is uh, universally trained offline, okay? Suppose we have a, a pair of uh, face images we want to verify, okay? So what we can do is we try to make this model to be adapted to this pair of face image to fit them better, but a lot deviated from this model too much. So it's a Bayesian adaptation process. Like uh, uh, then we, we're go going to get a new adapted the uh, Gaussian mixture model, okay? Then from that, we build this uh, pattern representation, okay? So if we look into the math, we really is a uh, very simple scheme where we just put a conjugate prior on the adapted uh, uh, parameters, and uh, this parameter is from the universal background model, and uh, this, this, again, this could be done in a Bayesian EM framework in an iterative fashion. Uh, really simple method, okay? So. So to see why we need this adaptation process. Suppose this is the pair of face we want to verify. Okay. If we look into the set of patches uh, we, we build a correspondence with, with the PEP model, okay. Here you can see for some of those patches, they are still misaligned a little bit, okay. This as we highlighted by the blue rectangle there. So this is the before adaptation. After we do the adaptation, as you can see, we, we really make the alignment better if you compare them, okay? So that's why this Bayesian adaptation scheme can help us to build better correspondence there, okay? So any questions on this part? So we're a lot trying to do a person-specific adaptation, uh, like in the speaker verification domain. We, here, we are really adapting the PEP model to a specific pair of images we are trying to match, okay? So, so then we can also do multi-feature fusion. We have a post-fusion process where if, you, if we have different type of features uh, to do the PEP model and uh, to, to do the elastic matching, then we can concatenate the decision score together, then train a linear SVM there to combine the score together. Okay, that's, that's a, a very routine process. I just want to mention it because uh, our results benefit from fusing multiple features. Okay. So we're going to present the results on two widely used uh, benchmark data set. One LFW, the other is YouTube faces data set. Okay, currently we rank number two in this uh, LFW database and uh, number one in the uh, YouTube video face data sets. So when we're talking about results in LFW, I should be careful because the uh, Gen Gen's team has really pushed the recognition accuracy to be super high, but they leverage the an enormous amount of external data to train their face alignment algorithm and train their uh, face verification algorithm. So we're, more, we're working on the most restricted uh, uh, protocol uh, without any outside training data. The reason is that we, um, my philosophy is that you should really come out with a representation which could generalize across different data sets. That's why we are confining ourselves just to RFW to see how it could generalize. So when we are comparing results, we are mainly comparing results in this category. So we are not comparing with the other uh, algorithms which leverage the enormous amount of uh, uh, external training data, okay? So here are just some details how we did the feature extraction and uh, things like that, okay? So we specifically, we, we used uh, like uh, uh, 1,024 Gaussian components in our UBM model, okay? So here is our, uh, results here. So this is the best results when we published our paper in CVPR 2013, okay? And the recently, there is one paper uh, published from uh, Oxford, like uh, I believe it's Andrew Zisman's group. They, they had also used the Gaussian mixture model, but they used the Fisher vector uh, to, to do matching, and uh, they are currently the number one. And uh, this, this results, this PM results is if we use uh, like a only LBP feature, okay? If we use shift feature, we get more or less similar results with the LBP feature, okay? So if we do this fusion, we can 
we can drastically improve the re our results, okay? So if we do the adaptation plus this fusion, like we, we can do even better, okay? Uh, under the ROC curve, I mean, we, we are not as good as them. Uh, so in terms of number, we are, we are about 1.5 below their accuracy. So, but still, we're currently ranked number two in this uh, benchmark, okay? So, but their algorithm needs to learn uh, to do heavily uh, conduct like a metric learning on different data sets, which is the part I, I don't like, but I respect their performance a lot, okay? So on the YouTube video faces, uh, Lord Miley algorithm really published results in this, this data set mainly because of computational issues, all kinds of issues there. So currently, when we published our results, this uh, uh, only, only Leon Wolf themselves published their results, okay? This is the baseline here, okay? So recently, some more algorithm published results there, like uh, the best one is this one, published in the biometric conference, okay? So, the, so our results, if we only use one type of features, we're about here. Look, uh, although we are, we are worse in the high force positive rate area, we are, we are nearly as good as them with uh, just a single feature in the low force positive area. That's the area we really care, okay? So if we use a different set of features, we, we are actually slightly, already slightly better than their algorithm. If we fuse them together, we already get better on here. If we do the adaptation, we do even better, okay? So currently, like, a, is, is a mix that we, we are still lower than those algorithms under this high false positive rate area, but we do significantly better in this low false positive area. So which, which group did the uh, biometric thing? This one? Yeah. Ah, yeah, that's a good question. I, I cannot remember. The, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a group not so active in communication. They are mainly active in the biometric okay. community. Okay, so I, ca I can send you some information no, later. that's okay. Sure. sure. It's in your paper. Yeah. So, Currently, if we do this, uh, we, we, in terms of recognition accuracy, if we, uh, we, we determine a single operating point, we are about uh, 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 1.5 better than the best algorithm published in the biometric conference. Okay? So, so this shows like, uh, uh, why this, the number is lower than the RFW data sets is uh, because the resolution of the faces uh, in, in this video face benchmark is a uh, lot as good as uh, as the RFW data set. So we're currently number one there. So, and also, I want to highlight like uh, uh, here, once we build the paper representation, we don't need to do f a cross frame uh, matching uh, as, as this, uh, most of these algorithms would do. Okay, they, they need to do this frame by uh, frame, uh, like a matching, then uh, identify the best matching there. Okay, so. So just, I mean, our algorithm is obviously not perfect. So the, which, by looking into these error results, which uh, could tell us which direction we should go. So here are some errors made by our uh, verification algorithm. As you can see clearly, like uh, we're matching a white face with uh, Asian face. Uh, this shows that we, we don't really have a, a comprehensive understanding of the face. So that's the direction we are trying to, uh, to go. We, we are trying to build some uh, like uh, do, do segmentation and do semantic labeling, try to really understand the face, like to avoid making such embarrassing errors. So that's, that's the uh, direction we're going, like uh, tr trying to really re drive the face verification accuracy to the next so level. level. Yeah, currently we're only using gray level images. Yeah, it's in color, color. Yeah. will play an important role, but uh, so far I, I haven't uh, seen uh, I mean, if there's any work, really leverage the color information so when, there. When you, you know, it's always interesting to look at these errors because yeah. it tells us we still have a long way to go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but when you report numbers like in the previous page that are 80%, right? That yes. means eight, on 80% 80 of the queries, you got the right person out of how many potential answers? Oh, yeah. The, this, this is not an identification task. It's verification task. So basically, the, this benchmark data says they build some uh, standard like a, uh, basically, the input is, is uh, face pairs. Okay. So you just make a decision if this pair is from the same person or not. It's a classification. The, uh, input distribution is 50% match. 50 yeah, 50, 50 percent. So the random guessing baseline is 50 percent. Yes. You're at 80, so yeah. you've sort of taken what's that? About three out of five guesses. You're doing better than random. Yes. Something like that. Yeah. Okay. Something like that. That's kind of state of the art. I, I, I think this benchmark they designed in this way to, 
to balance the training, really. I, I don't, I mean, as you can see, that the, the distribution of match and long match phases should not be 50-50% in real world, right? right? So it's, it's a skilled distribution. That's something perhaps in the future, the, the benchmark evaluation could need to be redesigned somehow, I think. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's, it's a way of measuring progress, but if someone who isn't a researcher in this field asked, uh, you know, if I give you a celebrity photo from mm -hmm. this, what's the chance that your algorithm will name the correct one? And let's say there are 200 celebrities in here. What's, what's the chance? It's like 5% of the time it'll guess the right person, or what is it? That's an interesting question. I think that the number I heard from Google, Picasa, is that the, what they can achieve is like a, on the top 10 results, they can make sure that 90% uh, of the cases, it could be correct. Top 10 in what, your family album at Picasso? No, 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 it's, uh, it's from, from all uh, celebrity face images they have in, the, in Google, in Google so Image do, Search. If you do celebrities, they're saying that in top, I see. So you take a celebrity photo, you ask Google, who is this? And it gives you a list of 20 names. And usually, if you kind of look in the top 10, it'll, it'll say, you know, uh, 90% of the time, the, the, uh, the, the correct name is in the top 10 faces. Right. So yeah. it'll, it'll say Carmen Diaz and, and Hank, you know, uh, and it'll name a whole bunch of people, some of which are opposite genders and, you know, kind of nonsensical, but somewhere in those 10, the right person may be there. Yeah, that's what I heard from that, but, uh, but uh, I mean, it could be that they never publish their results. In the For something like, you know, finding, just verifying what the labels are in the images that could be useful, but if you basically said something like, here's my personal Picasso photos, show me the ones with my daughter, this daughter. Mm -hmm. You know, the question is, will it sort of, you know, will 70% of the images be correct or only 20%, you know? I believe in the personal photo album, we can do much better because the number of identities is much less. Right, right. There's, there's much lower perplexity, yeah. but sometimes people look more similar, right? Sure. You can't, for example, take advantages of racial differences and things like that. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely true. I think uh, there's low, uh, really best benchmark for the, this, perhaps like uh, some efforts lead in that space really to evaluate the progress in, yeah. in that space. I think, I, I, I don't really see a lot of benchmarks there. So Simon and uh, when I was still in Microsoft, uh, Simon and uh, I, we explored a little bit right. on this fa family album scenario, but I think we need more serious benchmark in that space, but uh, it's kind of difficult, so yeah. Okay, uh, next I'm going to talk about face detection. How, how many of you here still think that face detection is solved the problem? Paul is no longer here, so it's safe to ask this question. <laughs> Raise your hand if you think it is resolved. No, I thought the uh, front face is it's it's resolved. Been pretty good. Uh, look, look at some of the, the mistakes you would make with a state-of-the-art face detector. So you're, you're missing a detection here. You will see that, I mean, that's embarrassing, right? That false alarm, why this is detected at face? That's very suspicious, right? We're also having some of the missing detection there. Okay, that's... The yeah. this, this is from Viola Jones uh, face detector from OpenCV. It is Lord Lester's best one, but uh, I mean, we, we tested one of the recent one like, uh, from Adobe. Like, uh, they have uh, example-based face detection algorithm. Like, uh, they are also making this kind of virus. Okay, I, I'm going to show. CV, so it's kind of the baseline if you just download free software. So. Yes, yes. So, <laughs> so we want to do better than that without a lot of efforts. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a really simple approach you can do this. So what we, do, we, we did is very simple, okay? Again, like, the philosophy is very simple, but I mean, the, the implication is uh, it, it, has, it could be inspired a lot of things there. So that's, that's the something I'm still trying to explore. So what we did is here, suppose we have a photo connection here, okay? So first I will set the, the decision threshold for, uh, for, from the offline trained detector to be really low, okay? To ensure the recall, okay? So I'm going to have a set of face candidate here. Of course, it's going to have false positive, okay? So then I'm going to ch choose perhaps the top 10% po uh, positives and the, the, the bottom 10% top negatives, and treat them as positive and negative examples. Then I'm going to build the PEP representation. Okay, suppose I have offline trained PEP representation, uh, PEP model there. I'm going to build a PEP representation on each image I connected here, okay? Then I'm going to simply train a SVM classifier on top of the PEP representation. Then I'm going to re-rank all these face images, then cut off uh, the threshold to uh, to, to, to see if we can do better. How many components do you use in the test? Uh, 1,024. So it's a we're really high dimensional vector indeed. So, yeah. so, but that's, that's what we did. As simple as it is, 
After I describe this, I don't need to go through all these slides because that's essentially what we did to see if we can make it better. Okay. So we tested our algorithm on three photo albums. This E album and the G album actually is, is connected by, by Simon, I, and uh, Ashish like, uh, back like, uh, several years ago. Uh, we still have some induction there. And, uh, uh, so, uh, and the, the, the other one is the FTDB database, uh, which is, again, released by Eric Lenny Miller from UMass. And, uh, he did some funny thing. I have a lot of discussion with him recently. So essentially what he did is he connected some web photos, then runs the Viola Jones detector and picked up all those ones failed there. So he's specifically screwing up Viola Jones face detector. I mean, so this set of photos are really challenging. Okay. The current best algorithm like a detector there is a face detector called XZJY published by Adobe. They, they have an example base. They build a, like a, a database of 10,000 faces just to, doing this example matching to do face detection and achieved the best uh, uh, performance so far on this FTTB database. So we're going to show that by using our adaptation scheme, very simple ones, we can improve both the Viola Jones face detector and the XZGY detector, okay? So, so first, uh, I'm going to play a video, so, but here just uh, some subjective results, like uh, this is uh, on the G album, the XZGY detector still are making those are embarrassing false positives, and we can get rid of those. And there are cases we can also, yeah, here is the, the results we show here is mainly uh, like uh, eliminating false positives, but uh, we also have cases where we can actually get the uh, false negative back. I'm, I'm going to play a video later. But in terms of uh, uh, performance curves, okay, so first I want to show that this paper representation is really also good. To, to differentiate face and long face, okay? So here we did the same adaptation process with just a, a concatenated safety de, uh, descriptor, meaning that we, we are not doing the, you're using the Gaussian mixture model to select those uh, uh, part features. Instead, we just densely extracted the safety descriptors, okay? So here is the performance of the Viola Jones detector. So if we simply use the safety representation, we are a lot less necessarily doing better, okay? But if we use the paper representation and use the, uh, and the doing the adaptation, we can do much better okay, on this G album. Okay. Which shows that, the, I mean, the reason is obvious. After we do this paper representation, we, we are reducing the, uh, the, the within class variation of those face, uh, real face images. Although the background like, uh, may, may be st uh, staying the same because they, they are random anyway. Right? So, but we are making the face class to be tight so that we can do better. And uh, here is uh, some more comparison on the E-album. So here is the performance of the Viola Jones detector, and this is the XZGY detector. As you can see, this detector is really much better than Viola Jones, and uh, nearly perfect, okay? So uh, let me see, this is our algorithm, uh, example-based uh, detector adaptation algorithm we published in CVPR 2011. It, it improved the Viola Jones detector, but a lot making the XZGY detector to be better, okay? If we, if we use our paper representation, we manage it to, uh, to improve both from the Viola Jones detector and uh, even made some improvement from the XDJY detector on these data sets. Okay, so we make, made it much better. So on the G-album, again, this is the results from our CVPR 2011 work. It works mainly for video, like this example-based approach. So that's what really make a lot of progress. If we use this paper representation and do this representation, as you can see, after adaptation, even from the Viola Jones detection results, we, let me see, we, yeah. So we, we, the blue curve is already better than the XDGY detector. So which shows that this, this is really helpful to do this uh, uh, one cycle iterative re-ranking there, okay? So this is on the benchmark, like a FTTB database, like a, a the discrete score means that if, if your pre, uh, predicted detection has more than 50% overlap with your uh, ground truth, then you claim it to be a, a correct detection. Okay, so, so the, this red curve is the XDJY uh, detector results. And uh, here are some baselines published before, like they, uh, they, they use the different local features, like they, this one I believe uses the surf feature. And this, this is uh, published by Eric Lenny Miller's group. They are using a, uh, they are also doing this type of uh, adaptation, but using a Gaussian process classifier in the middle, okay? So, uh, so if we do this uh, 
fold by fold adaptation because they have a 10 fold cross validation process. If we only do the adaptation fold by fold, we can enhance the results. We already enhance the results significantly. I'm not so sure. I didn't put the all fold adaptation results there. I should add it back. Actually, we can do even better than this, okay? So this should be the continuous score. Continuous score is you're measuring really the overlapping uh, between your predicted rectangles and that. So I should change these slides a little bit. So uh, as you can see, this is the XGGY detector. And after uh, we adapted it with the PEP representation, we made it significantly better. So here, I, I would like to play the video, perhaps just give you more sense that uh, this representation is also good in, in bringing some of the false false negative back. Let me see. OK. Yeah. So that, as I said, we, we are going to present this piece of work in ICCV soon. Like, uh, yeah, this is the Viola Jones detector. Performance is valued at uh, like 90% recall rate. Yeah, here is the false positive. Get, it, get rid of it. Yeah, we have a false negative here, missing detection. And we get it back after this adaptation. Here is an embarrassing one. You may wonder why, why these kind of uh, patches are detected as a face. If you do histogram equalization on that face patch, you will see it looks like a face in the end. Uh, this album is actually published by Xiao Ou before. Yeah, get rid of this. Yeah, we can get this back. Okay, I will simply stop the video because it's, it's just really show that it's better indeed. Let me see. Put it back. So just some discussion on this type of um, adaptation scheme. I think uh, it could inspire a lot of interesting things because you could think of like this, this is kind of uh, a process where we are trying to adapt the regression algorithm to, to the statistic of the, the data sets you're dealing with. It's, it's just a light way of doing that, but I, I, I would say that uh, there, there could be a lot of interest in seeing. Uh, uh, induced from that. I, I believe Char did something uh, for detector adaptation before, right? With, uh, with a Tyler expansion type of try to modify the detector. But here we are uh, doing a little bit uh, uh, differently, like by trying to leverage the examples, okay? So in unsupervised fashion. So, so just in conclusion, we have a, a post environment uh, face representation uh, induced from the uh, the PEP model, and uh, it showed the leading performance on both uh, face verification and face detection uh, tasks on benchmarks. So our future work in involves how we could uh, use this PEP representation for other visual recognition problems, such as scene recognition. And uh, we're currently doing some work where we're trying to see if we can uh, make a better uh, object detector uh, based on this uh, PEP representation idea. Okay, so. Before I end my talk, I, I want to grill your face recognition capability. Who is this guy? Without any hints. Okay, let me give you a little bit of hint. Okay. Oh. He plays chess. Oh. So Kasparov. Kasparov? I don't know. <laughs> I haven't been following chess in decades. <laughs> sure. <laughs> he played with Deep Blue. So I worked for IBM before. So, oh. this, uh, so I you remake this. So. We use the, his faces all across our uh, my talk, so uh, I want to thank him indeed. So I will stop here in case you have any questions. So, yeah. Do you play chess with Blue? No, <laughs> <laughs> Deep Blue not. Uh, I think IBM still have Deep Blue as a demo in their demo room, but uh, I mean it is never played again. I guess like uh, it's, it's kind of interesting. Now their focus is on Watson, I think, the, right. the D Deep QA project. It's very interesting. So yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank yeah, you. Thank you.